Hello, um, good afternoon. Uh, our honorable speaker today, Mr. Ronnie Chen, GBM, Mr. Shi Feng, Dr. Peggy Lam, Dr. Annie Wu, Dr. Elsie Learn, and also Ms. Pansy Ho, our distinguished guests, and also variable members of the Hong Kong Federation of Women. You know, good afternoon. I am Maggie Kuhn, the Vice Chairperson of the Hong Kong Federation of Women. On behalf of the Federation, I would like to welcome all of you to the China and the world inside the dynamics of a changing relationship, which is taking place this afternoon. All the invited guests here, including the country's Consulate General, namely Brunei, Colombia, Italy, Miami, New, New Zealand, Panama, Peru, and also Saudi Arabia. And also, we are a great honor to have Hong Kong U Vice Chancellor, Professor Jiang Xiang, and also our LegCo member joining us later, Priscilla and also Mr. Peters uh, Xia, and also the former chairperson, General Chamber of Commerce, uh, Mr. Aaron Herrera, professional bodies such as the president of our law society, president of the Youth Federation, our community leaders, I mean, education leaders, and also women entrepreneurs, you know, all coming here with our Hong Kong Federation members. So it is our privilege to have you all with us today. Apart from the on-site guests here, we also have over 500 online participants, mainly from Hong Kong, and there are 150 from mainland, and also 50 overseas, including US, United Kingdom, Australia, Singapore, Thailand, and Finland, who are all professionals from different industries and fields. Without further ado, may I invite Dr. Annie Wu, a funding member and supervisory consultant of our federation, onto the stage for a welcome speech. Ladies and gentlemen, may I welcome Dr. Wu. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, our honored guests, especially Commissioner Sefong, our guest of honor, and all our consulate um, generals in Hong Kong, and our leaders in education. I'd like to say thank you to Ronnie to give me the honor to, ex to uh, introduce you, because I don't know how to uh, introduce you. I take, it takes me about 24 hours. So in order to shorten it, I don't I introduce you on the usual what we call the CV because we have attached your CV and all your distinguished records attached with the um, in our folder. But let us to give our friends here what I know of you as Ronnie, the person, the visionary global leader of all times. You are talented, you are inspiring, you are a fascinating, exciting, eloquent speaker, and your re remarks are extraordinary, colorful, resourceful and sometimes very invigorating, and you leave a lot of the remarks food for thoughts because I've attended all your meetings and all the speeches in Beijing, in Great of the People, in the Morningside events, in Davos, in uh, Asia Society, and also in this place. Uh, this Asia Society is your very well-known baby. I think we can say that. So all in all, I think Ronnie leaves a legacy not only in Hong Kong, his hometown, but he also leaves a legacy in China and the world. And all in all, Ronnie has the heart of gold. So I just want to share you what I know as Ronnie, what he has done in uh, China under the China Heritage Fund. That was back in year 1999 when he helped the, what you call the, uh, the Ministry of Culture to really sponsor the Palace of Established Happiness, uh, restoring the garden in the Forbidden City. The Chinese name, of this is the Jian Fu Gong in the Zijing Cheng. And that was a very unique because the UNESCO people really give their heads off to what you have done for, for, for uh, preserving culture. And in your speech, in your book, I remember you mentioned about it. The destruction of a nation's cultural heritage reflects the country's decline and turmoil. But its restoration is a sure sign of the country's rise and prosperity. 
and your remarks is very invigorating. This is a sign of the times when finally East and West are learning to work together in harmony. After all, the Forbidden City is a cultural site, not only of the Chinese people, but of all mankind. And also in your closing remarks in this book, there are only two more left, so people have to go and hurry to buy the book in the, in the bookstore. Ronnie expresses the same analogy when he ponders upon the timeliness of his own participation. It is always easier to destroy than to build. This is as true for a palace as for a garden. Equally, it is true for a nation. Culture flourishes in times of prosperity and with us in times of turmoil or war. Isn't it appropriate that as China finally re-enters the family of great nations, and as China rises economically and politically on the world scene, that somebody should come along and restore this garden. I should invite you all to visit this garden at your convenience. Another uh, area that I know Ronnie and his heart for the Asian society was, back in 1995, Ronnie then brought the group to open up the first Chinese summit in Beijing. The title was called China and its Neighbors. The first time that um, Asian society set foot in the China world and the summit attended by 500 people. And after that, Ronnie helped our leaders in China to set foot on the world because as the member of the governing board of the Davos uh, in uh, Switzerland, he invited then the Vice Premier Li Lanqing and other leaders to deliver and address their work in our economic forum in Davos. So all in all, Ronnie has been doing so much, not only for Hong Kong, but for our country and for the world, bringing China to the world and the world of China to China. And recently, Ronnie, as the co-chair of the China Center for Globalization and Strategic Advisory Board, he actually brought the CCG to Hong Kong in November 2017. And they are using Hong Kong as another platform to go overseas and to explain what China's policies and create more friendship between China and other places. So the last thing I'd like to mention, to share with all of you is, Ronnie received the award from the 2018 Eisenhower Global Leadership Award, and his acceptance speech was December 7th. The last message, I think all of us who are born in Hong Kong, who are living in Hong Kong, we share with Ronnie, because his last phrase was, I want to thank all of you for this prestigious award. And by the way, come see me. I live in Hong Kong. Give me a call. I'll be there waiting for you. I think all of us in Hong Kong, we want to say, come and see us in Hong Kong. We are here to wait for you. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, please give a well, warm um, applause to Ronnie. He's the man of all times. Ronnie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. That's it, that's it. Thank you. I think there's enough social distance between you and me for me to take it off. Thank you very much. Um, if anyone uh, disapprove of my taking off my, uh, my mask, either I leave or you leave, you, your choice. Uh, Annie? Um, Thank you for those wonderful words. Uh, however, there's one, one mistake that Annie made. The two projects that I rebuilt inside the Forbidden City, you cannot wander in. They are not open to the public. Uh, however, I'm sure if, uh, Annie, if you're on Annie's good side, she'll be able to manage to get you in. But can I propose the following? Annie and Pansy, um, after COVID-19 is over, why don't I take a chance to uh, invite all of you wonderful members of the Hong Kong Federation of Women uh, to the Imperial Palace, and I can even host dinner inside. Uh, <laughs> however, it is limited to uh, 54 people. So I would have, you will have to sign up first. So uh, uh, Annie, for, the, for that flowery uh, introduction, uh, that's what everybody else, else get uh, in return. So you should thank Annie for that. Uh, Commissioner Shefong, Council General, ladies and gentlemen, it's so wonderful to see you here. Uh, I'm just a little bit disappointed. I thought I'm going to be the only man here. I see so many others. Well, uh, so be it. 
Uh, I was asked to talk about China and the world uh, in, in, in an environment of a fast changing world. And I don't think that, you know, I, I'm not that young. I think I'm probably older than 99% of you here. And I just have never seen a time when the world changes as fast as the last couple of years, in particular, the last two years. And so allow me to um, leave China to the last. China, in my opinion, in my reading of the country, is more often than not reactive in what it does. Of course, it does a lot of things inside and outside of the country. Some of them, you have to say, they are rather proactive, such as the Belt and Road Initiative. But in terms of its relationship to the other great powers, from my reading, and I may be wrong, Commissioner can correct me, China is most of the time, if not almost, almost all the time, reactive. If the rest of the world doesn't give China trouble, China would not take the initiative to do too much. And so that's why I want to perhaps cover the rest of the world first, and then finally come back to China. Let's, let's begin with the United States. Obviously, we all know that it is by far the strongest country. It has a most, the highest per capita natural resource. It is the strongest in technology, in science, in politics, in military, in many other ways, in economy. So everything has to begin with the United States of America. So let me just very quickly trace uh, the United States after World War II. During and soon after World War II, the United States has amassed more credibility than any other country I know in the world, ever. And that credibility comes with it a moral authority, the likes of which is not seen in human history. Obviously, you have the other camp, the Soviet Union, China, and a few others. But for the most part, the world benefited greatly from the United States as an economic engine of global economy. So after World War II, the United States has perhaps more moral authority and credibility than any other country I know. And that matches the, shall I say, unmatched prowess of a country which has never been come close to by any other country I know in human history that I have read. Not the Roman Empire, not the British Empire, but the United States was rather unique. In hindsight, a lot of people don't like the Cold War. After all, perhaps we're entering into a new Cold War. So most people assume that the Cold War is bad. Well, no one likes wars of any sort, hot or cold. And surely Cold War was a dangerous time. Just remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mankind has never been so close to a nuclear confrontation like that time. However, think about this. Cold War is bad, but perhaps hot war is worse, or even the absence of Cold War can become very, very problematic. For example, during the Cold War, the United States was under restraint because of the presence of the then Soviet Union. The United States had no choice but to work with many of its allies. And it cannot do whatever it wants. It was under certain kind of restraint, self-imposed or otherwise, because of the presence of the Cold War. Everybody was in the free world, so to speak, was happy when the Cold War ended. However, as mankind, wis uh, the, the wisdom of mankind has taught us, power corrupts, 
and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The United States was under constraint, under restraint during the Cold War. After the Cold War, there's no longer any restraint. The United States can wield its power whichever way it wants. Is that good or is it bad? If the adage is correct, that absolute power corrupts absolutely, then perhaps we should think twice that Cold War is necessarily bad and the end of the Cold War is necessarily good. The United States, as Annie mentioned, oftentimes that which applies to a person applies to a country, or that which applies to a country also applies to a person. And the United States have been just too strong, too powerful for too long. It can do anything it wants. And in the absence of restraint because of the end of the Cold War, the United States actually begin to cut down its own credibility and moral authority. This is something that is seldom mentioned. Most people do not spend much time thinking, and certainly not out of the box. And so everyone assumed that Cold War is bad. And I remember an author, I forgot who it was, that wrote a piece recently, Cold War is bad, but hot war is worse. Well, we're not at hot war yet. But in the absence of Cold War, the possibility of hot war actually may increase rather than decrease. So today, we all know what's happening. The United States has decided to make China into an enemy. For those of us who have been working for the last, I personally have been working for 30 some years to try to forge better relationship between China and the United States. I have failed. I have completely failed. And in hindsight, perhaps I too suffer from a syndrome of wishful thinking that perhaps the United States will be wiser than all other former powers, which will make room for other people and to coexist together as other people rises. A lot of people blame Donald Trump for what's happening today. I said, not so. Don't blame him for everything. He's responsible for a lot of things, but not everything. I remember an old friend of mine, some of you may, not, may know him, Paul Wolfowitz, remember him? Paul Wolfowitz, when he became dean of the Johns Hopkins Sice School of Advanced International Studies, he gave me a call and said, Ronnie, I want to boost my China desk, my China department, who are really good scholars in the United States. And that must be, what, 1995, maybe? And such a person, in 1992, wrote a paper that is later call, called by some to be the Wolfowitz Doctrine. Basically, what it says is, the United States should not allow anybody to rise and become anywhere close to a challenge to the United States, economic or otherwise. So in other words, there are segments in American society, in particular in the policy, institute, and policy arena, which has a stated goal of not letting anybody rise except the United States. I knew that. I was afraid of Paul in this regard. But I thought that we should be friends. And so I invited him to speak here. I invited him to many other places. But apparently, he hasn't changed his mind. Another person for a long time not known to most of you, probably. But in 1999, I invited a person to speak at the Asian Society Hong Kong. And the next year, he came back. In the year 2000, I invited him again. At that time, the deputy, the, the, the deputy director of the Asian Society was a young American lady from New York City 
probably a good Democrat. He said, she said to me afterwards, she said, Ronnie, you invite this guy back one more time and I am out of here. That guy is a far right individual and he scared a heck of my staff who is a nice, maybe a Democrat. And what's the name of that person? John Bolton. He spoke here twice at least at my invitation and I told my staff, I said, hey, Asian society is apolitical. We invite anybody who is objective and has, has something to say. And John Bolton was a little bit more objective in those days. So you, what we see today is long in the making. It is not something just in the last four years under Trump or not even in the last 20 years. It has always been there. And 1992 was, China was nothing. I remember in those days, I flew to Beijing or Shanghai or whatever to do business. The first thing you, get off, you do after you get off the plane is just try to find a plane ticket home in order not to get stuck there, right? And in those days, they were already targeting China. So with all that has been happening in the last 30 some years with the rise of China, America is increasingly concerned. 1996 is another very critical year. I was talking to the author of uh, Thucydides Trap, you know, Professor Graham Allison, he's old, another old friend. And I told him, I said, you know, you guys really, really made a mistake in 1996 by sending two aircraft carriers to Taiwan when Li Denghui went to the United States. And so China shot blanks, I suppose, uh, across the island. And the American, uh, the US sent two aircraft carriers. And Graham Allison, who was, told me, he said, well, oh, Ronnie, at that time, I was in the Defense Department. In fact, I was one of those guys who proposed to send the two. And I said, Graham, I don't think your teacher would have done that. And all that, all the uh, military buildup that I can see since 1996 was a direct result of the Iraq war, the Desert Storm of 1992, as well as the 1996 incident in the Taiwan Strait. Then, of course, there is the eco economy. China's economy has been rising very fast. Who can blame anybody who wants to have better living? Having, better, having a better living for all is not a sin. But other people don't like you. They will try to contain you. And so you see the trade deal that is signed, first phase. I don't know the detail, but from, from what I can tell, China made tremendous, tremendous concessions. But as I always tell my friends, I said, America is not after trade. It is just something that Donald Trump is interested in. But he has surrounded himself with people like Bannon and John Bolton and many others, Pompeo. And as a result, it is not trade. Trade is a tertiary war. Technology leading to military prowess and perhaps the US dollar are far more significant in this conflict. Then of course, there's another reason beyond just military and economics and that is culturally, for the first time, the United States or the West in general is being challenged by a non-Western country. And you don't have to believe it altogether, but there's been a paper written by a US State Department individual that's basically said that, well, Soviet Union was still white people, Caucasian people, but China is not. So the old Cold War is a domestic conflict. This time is something else. So let me jump to the conclusion. Where do I see the whole thing will end? First of all, I think it's truly amazing that what America is doing today under Donald Trump, 
and initiating a Cold War. And then the last one, with George Kennan and so forth, in 1946, writing the long telegram, right, what, 6,000 or 8,000 words, there were spell out strategies. But in this time, I see no strategy. And I see no end game either. For those of you who are Council Generals here, you're diplomats, many of you. And imagine taking a decision that is that critical, that will affect the world for decades to come, with no strategy and no clearly defined end game. That is truly, truly amazing. So where will it lead? I don't know. We'll see what happened in the next election in November, but my worry is that the course has been set, and I don't think that it will easily be reversed. Maybe better here, maybe worse elsewhere. I fear that the course has been set, not because of China, what it did, but because the United States has decided to fall straight into the Thucydides trap. Just think about this, the definition of Thucydides' trap is the existing power taking action, taking the initiative to prevent the number two from rising, such as the sad history today. But then military is not the only thing. Finance, economics means a lot. Consider what Donald Trump did with the NATO so-called allies. They are now asking allies, his, uh, American allies in Western Europe to pay for more of NATO. When I first heard about it, I said, mm, makes sense. You know, you get protection, why not pay more? But then upon further consideration, I decided that perhaps it's more complicated than that. Perhaps by asking the European countries to pay more, it fundamentally changes the relationship between the United States and the European countries. Let me say this, uh, Commissioner Scheer and all the Council General, please forgive me. I'm gonna say something not so good about your profession, diplomacy, huh? As far as I can tell, and I've been reading about diplomacy for the last 40 years, as far as I can tell, diplomacy operates on the exact same principle as the mafia. It's just one with suits and ties and white gloves, and the other has brass knuckles. That's all. Sorry. So, in the old days, when the United States was willing to pay a lot for NATO, because there's a big bad guy supposedly out there called Soviet Union. And so the relationship, to use the mafia an uh, analogy, is that America is a boss, and all the European countries are the stooges. I pay you, and you fight that bad guy out there. So just like in mafia, those mafia boys, those stooges, are always very loyal to the big boss, because he pays you. And by the way, you have no choice anyway. You are stuck in Europe right next to the Soviet Union in those days. So they're very happy with the arrangement. But what about today? Today, America is saying, pay up. You have to pay more. That changes the relationship from one of the not so nice mafia arrangement to a much nicer one, but still not that good. And that is, what America is doing now is extracting protection money. You own a shop in some sort of boat or to moon or somewhere. And there are a little bit of mafia. Hong Kong is not bad. Hong Kong is really quite good compared to many parts of the world, but still, I didn't, I didn't say there's no such thing, right? So the bad guy comes and says, hey, give me money. If not, I will do something to you. And so if you are that shop owner, you will think, which is the lesser of two evils? 
the guy who wants money from me or Russia? And some of them may come to the conclusion, well, perhaps Russia is not that bad of a threat. Perhaps this guy is even bigger of a nuisance to us, the simple shop owners and keepers. And so because of that, the fundamental relationship between the United States and its allies have been changed. America has to do that partly because financially it is in debt. And yet, having been at the top of the world for so long, sometimes you tend to forget that you are not as wealthy as you once upon a time were. I think it can happen to any of us, right? We have seen it in Hong Kong among the wealthy families. Once upon a time, they were wealthy. But gradually, their finances have deteriorated, but they still think that they are wealthy. But a lot of things begin to change. And so the relationship between the United States and Europe is changing. Another story. A few years ago, well, about two years ago, I was in Guadalajara, Mexico. And I bumped into a friend from Switzerland who used to be the number two person in the World Economic Forum. And he told me, he said, he has been organizing a conference of highly placed uh, business leaders of Japan for the last 15 years. And this gentleman, who's a good friend of mine from Switzerland, he told me, he said, if a year or two ago I had proposed to study for this year whether America is a trustworthy partner, they will commit me to the institution, mental institution. But about three years ago, two, three years ago, the Japanese themselves proposed to study, to discuss whether the United States is still a reliable partner. I thought to myself, I said, well, I don't think you need to, add, to, to have such a meeting. All you need to do is to give Angela Merkel a phone call or give Macron a phone call. They know the answer already. Their phones were tapped. And many other things. You think Abe's phone was not? I don't know. But whatever it is, I think that the confidence of the allies of the United States is definitely on the wane. And these days, almost daily, I find articles somewhere in the West that talks about it. So for a long time, I've been proposing, I've been saying this, and I've, you know, you check my speeches. I've been saying this for a long time. And there was an article just, I just found out this morning that says that the United States is moving from unilateralism to isolationism. A couple of months ago, I gave a speech on Americans' isolationism. And one of the very knowledgeable individuals said to me, he said, Ronnie, do you mean to say isolationism or do you mean unilateralism? He has no idea. He still thinks that America is only acting in a unilateral way. I said, no, you heard me correctly. I didn't say unilateralism only. No, unilateralism is forcing the United States, voluntarily and involuntarily, to what isolationism. Consider one possibility. And I'm not the only one who speaks on this. Quite a few others, many others. Such as, for those of you who are in finance, Ray Dalio has been saying this. And that is, the United States dollar rests on one point, just like the tip of my pencil here. That point, is one word. It's called what? Trust. Right? And somebody told me that actually former Premier Wen Jiabao, while he was Premier of China, he said the entire global economy rests on one word, trust. I said, yeah, he's very perceptive. 
If the whole economy rests on the one world of trust, how about a currency? Especially now that it is no longer tied to gold. And so the United States dollar is very possible, very, very possible that it may break because of the breaking of confidence. All the unilateral actions of the United States is pushing America toward that point, but perhaps America is the least cognizant of that possibility. Consider this. The United States unilaterally sanctioned Iran. Then they got a coalition, and then Trump broke it, right? We all know the history. In the past, and the United States sanctioning United, uh, uh, Iran, so you cannot use US dollars to deal with Iran. So what happened? In the old days, everything go through the SWIFT system, where all the currencies are matched out in that global platform. And so the Europeans are forced to create another platform just to bypass the United States sanctioning of Iran by not allowing them to use the US dollar. And so you can see, and I can give you many, many more examples like that, that voluntarily or involuntarily, such as running out of money, the United States dollar is in a very difficult position. I forgot to say one thing about US isolationism, and that is a lot of people forget that the United States was never founded on internationalism. It's always founded in unilateralism, uh, in, sorry, uh, on isolationism. Consider Monroe Doctrine of 1823. Consider Manifest Destiny. Consider the fact that the United States never joined the League of Nations after World War I. Consider the trade barriers after World War I that eventually led to the Great Depression of 1929 to 1933. And today, the United States is still not paying United Nations dues, by the way. Another story, 1998 or 1999, I forgot. I was invited by a US Senator to his hometown, uh, just friends because I know him, I know his wife. He himself came to pick me up at the airport. I won't tell you where it is, but if you know something about America, you can figure out. This gentleman is today really somebody, okay? And anyway, he picked me up at the airport. We spent three days together. Took me to horse racing. I never knew how good his wife was. I was impressed. Moving about in those social occasions, helping her husband, political career. And one day, the couple took me in his car, and the senator, who is today really somebody in the United States, drove me around to show me their hometown. They were very proud of it. And I thought to myself, this city has probably 50,000 people. It's smaller than Sha Tin of Hong Kong. So what the heck am I? I'm not interested in this place. I had only one interest. My interest was to try to convince my friend to pay up the United Nations dues that they owe. That was 1998, I believe it was. And th what, two, three years ago, I was in his office again in Washington, DC. I, I said to him, so-and-so, you remember that time you hosted me and I tried to convince you to pay your United Nations dues? Sir, I'm a failure because you still are owing the United Nations. Of course, they left WHO and uh, whoever else, I think they also left UNESCO. And, and so all these are signs that America is moving back to isolationism. And if the United States dollar were to fall, everyone will suffer. But who will suffer the most? The United States will suffer the most. And when that happens, I believe that the United States may be forced back to isolationism to nurture its self-inflicted wounds.
America is too strong for anybody to beat them. And the US dollar is too strong for anybody to beat them. Beat it. The only one that can do so is America. And as far as I can see, America is working double time, triple time, doing exactly that. I began by saying that the United States has a lot of credibility and moral authority after World War II. Well, America has decided to cut them all down. That said, let me quickly add, don't write off the United States. Don't think, as some Chinese netizens foolishly, in my opinion, write, that America is forever waning. No. The system, the people, the natural resource is still very resilient, and in time it will rise again. But the path, immediate path ahead, maybe for the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, may be very painful. But let's not write them off, or else you may regret. So what will the world be like in the absence of the United States as a sole leader? It will be a very fragmented world. And I think that what we are witnessing these days, just in these few years in particular, although it is the fall has been gradual, there's no denying that in the last two, three years it has gone to the abyss. So the world will be a very fragmented place. I just hope that China will not be foolish enough to assume the leadership. You are what you are. You don't need to say it. If you're LeBron James, I heard that the Lakers won again last night. If you're LeBron James, that's a basketball player, one of the best. You don't need to tell everybody every day, I am LeBron James. Everybody knows you. That's good enough. Now let me turn quickly to Europe for a little bit. After World War II, the United States helped Europe, Marshall Plan, mainly because there is Soviet Union. If there had not been a Soviet Union and communism, I wonder if there will be a Marshall Plan. However, I think that in the last 70 some years, there are two issues in you that has caused it to become economically moribund. First one is that so social structure is very rigid. I remember what Deng Xiaoping said one time very wisely. He said China should never take the way of over socialism like Europe. To care for your people, socialism, call it whatever you want, it's fine. But don't go to an extreme of the European countries. That's number one. Number two, they are so enamored by the need for to build the <clears throat> EU. It's a wonderful experiment. It has done a lot of good, but the structure doesn't work. We in business know that no matter how good a deal you have, if you don't structure it right, you will have problem. And that's exactly what's happening in Europe today. So gradually, Europe has been waning. And economically, the United States is up there. Europe cannot bump against it. Down there, you have Japan that has really already maybe surpassed it in some ways. And then you have China. So it's sandwiched between having a very embarrassing economic position. So for a long time, I felt that there's no hope to Europe. And I have two teachers. I think, Commissioner Shea, I may have told you about my three teachers. I have three teachers around the world in the last 30 some years. And two of them, I have discussed this issue. And I asked them, unfortunately, two out of the three have died. I asked one of them, and this gentleman is the former head of state of one of the biggest European nations. I said, sir, how's Europe? He said, World War I destroyed half of Europe. I said, oh, so it's living off half a life. He said, no, Second World War did the rest. 
And this is the head of state of one of the biggest European countries. And he is considered to be the, one of the most knowledgeable individual in the whole of Europe. In my opinion, he is the best, bar none. So to him, Europe doesn't exist. And then I went to my American teacher and I said, hey, sir, how is Europe? He said, no hope. I said, oh, come on, there must be hope. I agree with him, by the way, but I just want to poke him to see, you know, what else is he going to say? No hope. And I said, come on, there must be a way out, no way out. And I said, if that's the case, then history tells me that there's only one possibility. History don't always repeat itself, but it always rhymes. And that is, a strong man will rise. He became very silent. And he uttered a few words. I hope it doesn't happen. Well, it's not up to him, not, not up to me. So to these gentlemen, Europe doesn't exist. And by the way, the second gentleman said to me, you know, we all know the, the saying that, you know, Europe is today like a, a, a museum, right? Frozen in time, you know, uh, of wonderful, wonderful past. And this gentleman has a better description. He said, oh, Europe today is like a nonprofit organization that is just interested in dishing up money for what environment and abortion or whatever, you know, uh, all kind of causes. And the causes may be very good, but, you know, that's all it is. And so for a long time, I'm of the opinion that Europe is basically not a serious player in the world, except you still have 600 some million people, so you can still buy a few things. However, I wrote to one of those teachers that is still remaining, two, two unfortunate have died. I wrote to him recently, I said, I changed my mind. I agree with you and our mutual friend in Europe for Europe's bleak future, but I think I changed my mind. I believe that Europe is finally on the move again. Why? Well, because Europe is figure, has figured out that the United States is no longer a trustworthy partner. So you have to fan for yourself. For example, whatever military equipment that European made, as long as it has Europe, uh, American technology in it, you cannot dispose of them or sell them or whatever, whichever you want. You have to get American approval. So what's, what's Germany and France doing now? They're joint forcing, joining forces to develop their own weaponry. And they, that will, by the way, have the side effect of stimulating the economy. Not bad. And I believe that as Europe progresses on that path, it will distance itself somewhat from the United States. How much, eventually, I don't know. But there's no doubt on my mind that it will, there will be considerable distancing from the United States because of the way the United States have foolishly behaved. But let me add quickly that don't assume that the fact that Europe may be moving away from the United States necessarily means that Europe will move closer to China. May not be so. So finally, let me just say a very quick word about Russia and the Middle East, and then I'll turn to China, and I'll end. The reason I put Russia and the Middle East together is because both of them are very much energy related. Russia, a country that I go to a lot. I go to, I've been going to Russia several times a year for many years because I'm a wandering soul. I like to learn about the world. So I go to the Middle East, I go to Russia, I go to, of course, I'm in the United States every month before COVID. I'm in Europe almost every month and so forth. And Russia is basically a, if the Consul General, I don't think the Consul General is here. If he is, please forgive me. European, uh, the Russian economy is basically a single industry economy, energy. And no wonder the, Russia is so much, interested, so much interested in the Middle East, which is also rich in energy. Whatever um, Russia's situation is, let no one underestimate the military technology that Russia has. I don't know how long it will last, but amazingly now forcing Russia into working with China, 
maybe it will last longer. Is that to the benefit of the United States by, put, by putting China and Russia together as the, as the joint enemy? To me, that is not the wisest thing. In terms of diplomacy, in the last 20 years, I, I know of no one who has played his hands as well as Putin. You know, like playing cards. He was dealt a really pretty tough hand, but he has played it so crazily well. And of course, if you want to play, play it well, you also need the other guy to play it badly. And I think the United States, such as Obama, has played so badly that just make Putin shine in the dipl diplomatic arena. So I believe that Russia and China being for, they are not, you know, natural bedfellows. Both of, them, both of those gentlemen, by the way, the European and American, not the Asian one, I didn't have a chance to talk to him about. When I asked him about Russia, both of them said the same thing to me. 4,000 kilometers of borders. One side full of people, no resource. The other side full of resources, no people. Not a good formula for good relationship, not to mention all the historic reasons. But the United States is today foolishly pushing the two together. And they complement each other in some ways. Russia surely need political help from China, <clears throat> maybe money. China also need Russia for many things, energy being the primary one, but also all the countries <clears throat> of the one belt, the terrestrial belt, all those countries west of Xinjiang all the way to Europe are basically former members of the CIA, so uh, countries, uh, countries of independent state. Well, anyway, Commonwealth of Independent States, the former Russian, they all speak Russian. So let me say a word about the Middle East. Uh, a lot of people ask me about what um, UAE and Bahrain have done with uh, Israel. I said, it is to be expected. I've been saying about that for a long time. Arabs are not the enemies of Israel. Only those people who don't read history think so. Before 1919, roughly, you know, with the Balfour Declaration, 1918, Arabs were the best friends of the Jews. If you are chased in 1492, chased out of Spain, huh? Inquisition, if you have no food, where do you go? If you find an Arab last name family, go there. You will probably be taken care of. So, of course, today geopolitics has other reasons for the rapprochement between the Arab countries and Israel. I was in, I was in Iran one time, only time, as a dumb tourist with a few business friends. And on television, I couldn't believe what I heard. That local official said, ooh, time is up, so I better quit. That says, Wahhabism is more evil than Zionism. Wahhabism, just in case those of you are not familiar, is a religious extremist in Saudi Arabia. So if you're Saudi Arabia, you're scared to death of Iran, which has 80 some million people and Saudi Arabia only has 27. And anyway, because of time, I better, I better go quickly. So enemy of my enemy is my friend. So Saudi Arabia have no choice but to go work, to work with Israel. And that is also the only way that they can attract America's support, continued support, because America is today producing more energy than Saudi Arabia. So the only reasons um, the, middle, uh, the United States want to be involved in the Middle East are two. Number one, Israel. Number two, to prevent Russia and Iran and Turkey from coming down. So I think that, you know, uh, then you say, why is UAE do taking the lead? Of course, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is not going to take the lead to uh, do something so risky. You know, you're the big boy. Back to the diplomacy. Sorry, uh, Commissioner. The mafia, right? Uh, you have the boss. Get the number two guys to go to go first. And there's nothing bad. Then you 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 go. Anyway, so at the end, I think that there will be four countries in the south: um, Saudi Arabia, uh, Israel, 
Egypt and the United States, plus a few little ones against the North, which are three countries, Russia, uh, Iran, and uh, Turkey. So let me very end by just saying that China has two big problems. Number one, China has energy sufficiency issue. Number two, China has food sufficiency issue. So the question that we all need to ask, in particular, the United States must ask is, can America beat China to submission? 30 years ago, sure. 20 years ago, yeah, probably. 20, 10 years ago, maybe. Now, probably not. So frankly, it's a lot better for them to work with China than to fall into the Thucydides trap. I think that China will have a hard time because you know the export market is cut to some extent, but I think China will get over it. China will do fine. In fact, I believe that China is relatively still the safest and most peaceful country in the world for a business guy like me. Uh, you need two things. You need stability, you need growth. China has, relatively speaking, stability and more growth. So I think that China is still a good place to do business. But the United States is playing very dirty today. America is picking on not just uh, China, they are not picking on the CCP, and then it's not just CCP, it's about Xi Jinping. Uh, it's really playing dirty. Uh, but I think that the Chinese people will only become more unified like, than, than, than before. So I think that China will do okay. Uh, so I think that uh, China, my last word is that, uh, should just be happy with quietly uh, building its own country economically, socially, uh, and stay away from uh, the thought of trying to be number one. It is really a stupid thought. Uh, if you are, you are, you're not, you're not. Uh, let the world decide uh, and just uh, enjoy your peace and tranquility and make a lot of money for yourself in the process. No, it's okay. I'm, I'll be happy to, to end. Uh, uh, should I talk longer? Okay, fine. Shall. I'm sorry. I, 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 because of time, I, I, Pansy is going to return soon, I, I suppose. Pansy, what should we do? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, so, 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 so let me just ex expand on what I had said about uh, China. Um, There are many, many issues here. I think the first one is really military and, and, and the, 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 uh, the technology that China has that causes concern on the part of the United States. And then you look at what it's doing. Why is it picking on Huawei? I think the former Singapore, Singaporean foreign uh, minister said it best. He said, oh, that's simple. It's because for the first time in human history, that someone is taking away the monopoly to spying by the United States. And then of course, with, the, with all the, the 5G, right? At least uh, <clears throat> uh, artificial intelligence, AI, and from there, all the military apparatus. Uh, however, I think I also have said this in the past, and let me say it again. That is, I believe China's Achilles heel, heel, the soft point, is its academic lack of rigor. Think about this. Today's military uh, 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 exercise is a, is a hugely complicated system, right? You have all the uh, satellites up there telling you everything, uh, where everybody is, and then you have all the uh, the, the, the land and all the sea and the under, underwater. So you have a, it's a very complicated system. And my worry is that China's lack of academic, free, uh, academic rigor is going to be, can become detrimental to China in that whole complicated process. All you need is in one point. You miss one point. The whole thing can flop. And so I think that the tradition of academic rigor is critical, not just for scientific development. Of course, that is the basis of technology and hence, and hence military. But also in the operation, in the military operations, the exactness and the rigor with which one has to exercise in order to make everything work is critical. That's why I always tell people Germany and Japan will always be formidable enemies if they become your enemy. 
because they are so rigorous in everything that they do. Do you know that today they are... Okay, Germany has lavitational train, right? And the Shanghai lavitational train come from where? Came from Siemens. And Siemens told me, we won't give them the critical technology. And the head of the lavitational train company in China told me exactly the same thing. Siemens will not give it to us. So I said, what are you going to do? Nothing we can do except to try to do it ourselves. So I've only met that guy twice. Years later, I met him again. I said, how is it going? He said, done. We got it. Okay. Do you know there's a third country who has lavitational train technology, which is very advanced? And that is Japan. Do you know that there is, I was told, huh? I, mean, I, I cannot confirm, <clears throat> but I think it's correct, that they have a train that is, is running for 15 years just to make sure that there's no possibility of mishaps. Do you know that the bullet train has no exit door, uh, emergency exit doors? Why? Because they don't expect that they will be, it will be necessary. I still don't think it's a good idea, but nonetheless, they are so confident. Next time, before you take the bullet train, think twice. You may be the first. I hope not. So, 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 so the, uh, it's, I'm so glad that Professor Dang Shang uh, is here from Hong Kong University, the Vice Chancellor. The academic rigor is so critical to the future success of China that I think that China will do well to pay attention to it. I think China has done very well in dealing with a lot of corruption first in the military and then in the government. Now, obviously, nobody's perfect, but anyway, it's much better than before. But the last area that China needs to work on is academic rigor, without which you can only be a big country, Da Guo. You can never be a Chang Guo, a strong country. So I think that I hope that China will improve in this area. Why do I say that? China will be relatively peaceful because I believe that America will eventually find out that they cannot beat China to submission. What are you going to do? Start a hard war? Maybe in limited basis, perhaps mutually agreed beforehand. But whatever it is, it is less likely. And the risk is too high. And short of that, I think Eventually, America will wake up and realize that perhaps it's not a good idea to pick on China. And let, ladies and gentlemen, let no one be mistaken. Don't think America is a country of principle. I, I, I want to say it in Chinese first, okay? 美国的身段也是很柔软的. United States can bend very pliably. When they need to change, they will change. Then when they figure out eventually that China, they cannot beat China to submission, then perhaps they will be forced to accept China as a co-equal. In fact, let me end with this. In fact, I've always said this, that in my opinion, and I represent no one, Commissioner Xie has to be careful what he says because he represents the government, Beijing government. I don't. I've always said, that China is very happy to play second fiddle to the United States. All are equal. All men are created equal and all countries are equal. But there are some that are more equal than others. You know that American saying, right? Look at Aaron here, my good friend. Aaron is tall and handsome. He stands up every day, look. I'm short and ugly. I walk in, nobody notice. We're equal, but we're not equal. So in international affairs, same thing. Read the 1992 Paul Wolfowitz paper again. Basically, it says, we don't need to worry about any of our allies. They mean nothing. They can help nothing. We'll do everything ourselves. That's in 1992. Can they do it again today? No longer, but nonetheless. I believe that China will be very happy to be, to play second fiddle. And I told my American friends the following. I said, 
you know, Americans are really smart people, and they come up with some amazing sayings, such as, first among equal. If you are, first, if you are equal, you're, there's no first and second, right? But an American came up with a saying called first among equal. So I say, I'm ethnic Chinese, and you say Chinese are very good in copying and tweaking it. So let me be a Chinese, ethnic Chinese and tweak it a little bit for you. China has another saying, in, as far as I'm concerned, I created it. That is, you probably never heard of it. It's called second among equal. To the Americans, there's no concept. They never dream of a thought, of the thought, second among equal. They only know first among equal. Okay, you'll be the first among equal because you are LeBron James. But I'm not bad too. So I'm second among equal. So let me conclude with a story. About six, seven years, six years ago, I was giving a talk uh, at the Hay Adams Hotel outside of the White House uh, in Washington, D.C., and Kevin Rudd, the former Prime Minister of Australia, was interviewing me. And I said the same thing. China, as far as I can tell, has happened Happy to be quietly, of course, second among equal. To the, to the world, everybody's equal. Congo and whoever else, Somalia, everybody's equal. But it's not equal. So your colleague, Chui Tian Kai, Ambassador Chui Tian Kai, was sitting in the front row. So the organizer said, Ambassador Chui, we're so delighted, so honored to have you here. Would you like to, that was an Asia Society event. Would you like to say a word before we conclude the evening? So Ambassador Tsui got up. Of course, he cannot agree with me. You know, I, as a nobody, can say anything I want. You know, second among equal, third among equal, whatever. He cannot say that. So he said, well, some of the things Mr. Chan says, I think that is worthy of consideration. But we, China, have long decided that we do not want to be number one because it is very expensive. We prefer to be number three, number four, number five, that's fine. But one day we woke up and suddenly we found ourselves to be number two. Then we realized it's a very dangerous position. You turn to the right, the number one slap you. You turn to the left, the number one slap you. And he sat down. Brilliant, brilliant. Think about it. Everybody who left that room will forget, have forgotten what I said, but they will be thinking about what Ambassador Trey Tenkai said. And a lot has happened in the last five, six years since that evening in Hay Adams Hotel in Washington, D.C. I think that today, that answer is perhaps more critical than ever before. And I think that from what I can tell, what some of the things that Yang Jiechi and Wang Yi have said, that China is very open to discuss any time in a nice way, of course, as equals. But I am, my fear is that the United States has unilaterally gone down the Thucydides' trap that will leave China with very little alternative. But I'm still happy that Yang Jiechi and Wang Yi said what they say, if the newspaper is correct, that the door is open anytime America wants to talk, we'll talk. Commissioner Xie, you're the expert. If I say anything wrong, please correct me either publicly or privately. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you to Ronnie for your enlightening and resourceful inspiration speech. You know, please take a seat and then now when I invite you know, um, our chairperson of the Hong Kong Federation of Women, Ms. Pansy Ho, to join us for this uh, moderation session. I think that a lot of you have you know, the question paper here, or maybe we can you know, also have any questions from the floor. I mean, it's all a very meaningful interaction. Thank you. Ronnie, uh, Mr. Chen, for sharing oh, with Ron, us. Ronnie's okay. Ron, yeah, mm -hmm. for sharing with us your really valuable observations and insights. Actually, I'm so humbled here because I actually fought to take up this role as the moderator because now I can boast to tell people I moderated a session with Ronnie who had in the past moderated a session with Putin before. 
So I'm the moderator to the most you know, famous moderator. So to be honest, I think Ronnie had already explained a lot to us about and bringing us, of course, a much closer understanding on the current relationship between China and the world and how we, just as you know, layman and general public can try to anticipate the challenges and hopefully find answers you know, for our own future outlooks. Now, of course, needless to say, not only are you one of the most brilliant economists, you obviously have demonstrated how you are also one, you know, with a unique geopolitical insight, um, having accumulated decades of experiences through direct dealings, you know, and exchanges. So here, in fact, I'm here really only just to prompt, you know, um, maybe a, some more specific, you know, kind of perspectives. We know, and you know, that China is definitely undergoing this rapid and even historical change in global political relationship, as you had already helped outline. And with, you know, her efforts in the management of this pandemic situation, well, some actually sees it as, as a way of bringing about a possible paradigm shift in terms of the global order. Well, if I may ask your opinion, what do you think after the pandemic situation is under control of the role that China could best position herself in the scene of the global revival? I saw the, um, the pandemic as a great opportunity for China to really shine in the world, especially by March of this year, because by that time, the chance of uh, China containing the virus was uh, already quite good. Uh, as you know, some of you know, uh, I'm building a uh, seven and a half million square feet uh, shopping center and office towers and hotel in Wuhan. And so I'm very sensitive to it. Uh, 200 of my staff were there and uh, eight, 17 or 18 of them are from Hong Kong. I'm happy to say that none of them caught it. Okay, thank God. Uh, so I thought that as things were coming under control, it is really a chance for China to really um, uh, help the world export um, uh, PPEs and many other uh, masks and so forth to the rest of the world uh, and, and teams of experts. I heard that China did that, but it seems to me that uh, the publicity uh, perhaps was not there. Uh, and so uh, what was a wonderful work was really turned into a very negative thing because uh, the, the, the media is basically controlled by the West, in particular by the United States. Uh, but I think that leaders and people of those countries still know that a lot of the material came from China. For example, I have some friends in Africa. So I wrote them a couple months ago. I said, uh, can I send you some uh, masks? And they said, oh, we already got some. I said, where from China? So China has been doing really a lot of good things, but you know it's really getting a bad rap for it. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I really, of course, there's a lot of things called the Zhan Lang Wai Jiao and all the kinds, you know, the, the the some of the military, some of the uh, diplomatic. Sorry, uh, Commissioner Xie uh, was a little bit, perhaps a little bit too aggressive. That really scared a lot of people. So it really worked to negate a lot of the good work that China did during the coronavirus. I think that. Uh, as a um, as a major big country, one has to be kind to everybody. And I believe that China has tried, but as I always tell people, China is like, a, if anybody from New Jersey, forgive me, uh, like a Jersey girl, uh, suddenly thrown into the big stage, uh, Broadway stage, and it's a stage fright, uh, and, and, and just don't quite know how to behave in the international arena. Uh, I think China has to learn in that regard. Thank you. Um, just early on, you have given us a very enlightening analysis surrounding this notion of the Thucydides trap, which potentially could thrust us back into a new Cold War confrontation, uh, coupling with you know, also the analysis of how fundamentally the roles and relationship between the US and the Western countries, the NATO alliance, also are developing 
are we you know, going to have to worry? And how do you look at China continuing to develop the Belt and Road Initiative in light of you know, all these dynamics in the world uh, kind of juxtaposition? Well, obviously, China has to worry. And I believe that uh, every thinking China, Chinese is worrying. Uh, after all, I say to people, I said, I have never seen, OK, let me say this. America is the strongest country mankind has ever seen any time. And all the forces of the, the full force of the United States has only ever been against one country once before, and that is the Soviet Union. And we know what is the result of that. And today, the United States is focusing that, its full force, on one country. Well, one and a half country. Russia is a distant, distant second. It's China. And in particular, very, uh, very vicious on one person. And I think the Chinese have to be very careful, understanding uh, the, the, the situation today. Let me tell you a story. As many of you know, in the last 20 years or so, uh, a lot of mainland Chinese uh, intellectuals uh, were really admiring uh, the, 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 uh, the, the democracy of the West. And I always thought that these guys are really misguided, really misguided. I'm not saying democracy is not good, but you think that there's no problem with democracy, you're really naive. Every country, every system has its own problems. We have our own, so does everybody else. And so I think that those people, and one day I, I, was, I had lunch at Hong Kong Jockey Club in Beijing, and one of those guys was there. And I told him, I said, I know that you, are, you have a lot of gripes against your own government. He's Chinese, of course. But I, can I suggest that now is not the right time? Save it for another time. Because I've never seen the full force of the strongest country ever in mankind, focusing on one country, and in this case, one person. This is not a time for China to argue internally who's right, who's wrong. Now it's time to unite. Uh, and, and, and so I think that uh, obviously China has to be worried. But as I said earlier, I believe that China should be able to weather the difficulty. As far as the Belt and Road Initiative is concerned, I think that the, all that you know, bad US-China relations may help Belt and Road Initiative because Russia will be far more amenable to developing it, especially the one belt, the terrestrial belt, the one road, winning the sea road. OK, that's a misnomer. It should be one route, not one road, huh? because in English, uh, there's no row on the sea. Uh, uh, but anyway, so the one route, um, uh, it's really controlled by the Seventh Fleet. Uh, and, and this is just nothing you can do. So I think that uh, to develop the one terrestrial belt uh, may be a good time. But you need uh, the government to take the lead uh, for specific reasons, which I will not go into. OK, now I have a number of questions. So I try to rush through them because everybody would obviously want to have some of your uh, you know, wisdom. Uh, this is actually written, and I'll read it out um, to you in specific. Dear Ronnie, thank you for your inspiring speech. You mentioned, and I agree, China to welcome the US you know, to talk or negotiate in a nice way. Rather than happy to be the second fiddle, do you think? China also see their problems, as mentioned, uh, including energy and food insufficiencies, and also the gap between the U.S. Uh, I mean, the gap between the U.S. and the U.S. on technology and military front. That is, maybe they also might know that it is still not yet the best time to play tough. This is from your student at uh, HKUST. The best time for what? The best time the for the best time to play tough. Oh, tough. Oh, I see. Uh, put it this way. It depends on what you mean by play tough. OK? Uh, there's something that you cannot avoid. For example, uh, when Deng Xiaoping says, Ta huang yang hui, lower your head, don't, don't, don't expose yourself, just build up your strength, right? 
That at that time, China depended on ex imported energy about two percent. Today, the number is more like close to thirty percent. The world has changed. China has changed. So you have no choice but to protect the sea link. And we all know that the sea link is totally dominated by the United States. So any of you watch a movie called Captain Phillips? You did. Good. Tom Hanks, right? He's a captain of a tanker in a, from the United States, and he got out of Gulf of Hormuz, if I remember correctly, uh, from the Persian Gulf or the Arabian Gulf, and then he, his, his ship was hijacked by Somalian pirates. He called the Seventh Fleet beforehand. He can also call the Fifth Fleet, which is in Bahrain, right? Or the Seventh Fleet, which controls much of uh, the Indian Ocean. He can call them, and eventually he was bailed out. So next time, it is not Captain Phillips. Zhang Xiang, you're no longer a professor. Next, next time, you are Captain Zhang. So what, who will you call? Right? Would you call the Seventh Fleet? They are the one who, in 1996, sent the two aircraft carriers to Taiwan straight. So who would you call? You have no one to call. So if you consider uh, building a blue water navy to be play tough, then I would say, what about Captain Zhang? What will happen to Captain Zhang? So the world has changed, so you have to do something about it. But on the other hand, whoever my student at the Hong Kong UST is, is still co correct. That there's still a, a, a considerable gap in science, in technology, in, uh, uh, in, in, in military apparatus and so forth. Uh, and so still you have to buckle down, keep your head slow, right? Don't expose yourself and strengthen your own domestic economy and society. So I think that the, the two are not necessarily contradictory to each other. We need both. Okay, quickly, then I know many people are very keen to know technology is a way of shortening the distances or, you know, really trying to pull people around the world together. But do we see now that, you know, it has been now more of a barrier for China-U.S. relationship? Well, let me answer it this way. Bill Gates at one time, he said, he is amazed. How come there are so many smart people in the world, and yet so few of them con uh, concentrate, focus on studying the bad things of technology? We all know the good things of technology. We all benefited from it, and we love it. And we cannot. And technology is not something you can go back on. Once out, it's out. So we all enjoy it. But on the other hand, if you don't understand the negatives of it, you're really foolish. And if you're not prepared for it, you're really foolish. For example. To talk about clean network is a joke. And yet all the Americans believe it. We cannot have TikTok, you know, uh, gather information on our people, uh, on Americans, uh, because uh, of privacy. I said, any one of us have any privacy today? I remember watching a video of a American journalist in Washington, D.C. with two iPhones both turn off, one even on airplane mode. He went on a three-hour trip to the National Cathedral, the library, the, uh, the cafe, and the, uh, and, and the hospital. He went, after three hours, he went back to his office, plucked it in. It recorded everything he did. And there was another article just out a week or two ago on the same thing. And so there's no just thing called clean network. And, and yet, President Trump and Pompeo are talking about clean network as if there is a thing called clean network. And only stupid fools will believe it. But almost everybody did. And so that's why I said, I said, this is a proof that American citizens, which is supposed to be very educated, American voters and so forth, are as, as foolish as some of the netizens in China thinking that they are somebody, they, can, they are not number one and this and that, foolish. But anyway, so I think that uh, technology uh, uh, must be viewed in a proper way. One, one final thing. Uh, to America, uh, to the West, technology is only good. And I believe, I worry 
because the financial crisis is just around the corner. Every 10 years, look at history. There is some serious financial crisis happening somewhere in the world. And, and it's all caused. It, it's not caused by. It is enabled by technology. And the Western philosophy, in particular American philosophy today, is very problematic. And that is. And that guides the capital market in the world today. Bigger is better. Faster is better. Freer is better. After 1985, was it? Uh, the, the Plaza Accord, uh, and then with the fall of Soviet Union, you know, the, uh, the Big Bang and all that stuff, uh, technology has been unleashed, and mankind's living has been improved greatly, no question. But on the other hand, if you think that that's only good to it, then I would say listen to Bill Gates. Chinese believe in Zhong Yong Zhi Dao, the way of the middle, way of the median. I think that the West, unless they change the philosophy, it's not just the technology. Technology is just a tool. Unless they change the philosophy, which means the heads of the people that are using technology, America, the West will be in trouble again because financial crisis will come again. And if it coincided with a, a loss of trust in the greenback, the US dollar, then hell can break out and it will be bad for every one of us, in particular the United States. Well, I have only time for two more final questions, but very important ones. One is if the mainland, if China, is going to be first in producing the vaccine for COVID-19, will it actually help China's international relationship? Well, it depends on how you use it. Uh, obviously, you, you, you first have 1.4 billion Chinese to take care of. Right. If it is if it started in Britain, say, for example, I'm involved in a team, by the way, uh, that is working with Britain. Uh, there's only about 60 million people. So you can you can take care of your own people very quickly. But with China is 1.4 billion. Right. But I think that if, if so, then it would be very useful if China can help the poorer countries uh, uh, and, and the most affected countries. You know, and, and it has also uh, geoeconomic and geopolitical benefits as well. So it's a win-win uh, for China. So I, I, I hope that they will be the first, but I don't know. Then coming back closer to home, this is, I hope, and I feel it's a good way to wrap up today. How would all the talks and discussions about such, you know, big, uh, big picture world dynamics affect ultimately the future of Hong Kong? Do I have to answer this? Yes. Okay, uh, very simple, very, very simple. Um, I've always said this, that Hong Kong's future is the mainland. I mean, as a business person, if you live in the 50s, you rely on the uh, American business. In the 60s, Europe added, right? In the 70s, Japan added to it, right? And then eventually Southeast Asia and the rest of the world. And by the 80s, who is our biggest customer? Who is our biggest client? Whichever way you look at it, it is the mainland of China. And so if Hong Kong doesn't know how to work with China, you're really, really foolish. And by the way, politics, especially petty, small local politics, does not feed you. In fact, it may make you poor. So I think Hong Kong has to wake up and recognize that our future, whichever way you look at it, economically, politically, in many other ways, is tied to China's mother, Hong Kong's motherland. And so if you don't know how to work with mainland China, there's no future as far as I can see. But if you do, then I think our future can be very bright because there's 1.4 billion people up north. They all you know, there's a lot of complementarity between Hong Kong and the mainland of China. And how would you like? And that's why I say Taiwan is so, so foolish. So, so foolish. I mean, the Taiwan's economy is, is today uh, is, is in, in hell, right? Uh, I purposely went there three times, I think, last year uh, to study the economy. I came away with, with a strong impression. And, 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 and if, they, if they play it right, they will be, that, they will be a big beneficiary. Uh, but they are not smart enough about us Hong Kong people. 
are we equally foolish or can we be a little bit smart? So ladies and gentlemen, it's up to you. I trust in you to save Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Let's give a big applause to Ronnie and I will definitely take you on on your offer for the 54 lucky people that I'm going to organize who might have a chance to go visit uh, the uh, Museum Palace. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, we More can come, but dinner is only 54. <laughs> Thank you so much, you know. Okay, now we would like to uh, say a piece today on the stage. Now we invited our commissioner, you know, Xie Feng, you know, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of People's Republic of China um, in Hong Kong SAR to uh, together with uh, Ms. Ho to present a souvenir um, to Mr. Ronnie Chen. And also we would like to invite, you know, our life, honorary life pre president, Mrs. Peggy Lam, to join us, you know, in this photo take. Thank you so much. Okay, wishing you all have a wonderful evening and thank you for all of you here online and also on site. And then in closing, I hope all of you have a very insightful conversation today and a happy Mid-Autumn Festival and happy National Day. So it's a double celebration. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful.